So this is session number seven out of our eight sessions for the year. We have already completed six of them. Um, and if you haven't seen them, if you've missed anything, if you go on our website, you can actually um, watch the majority of them. I'm not sure if they're all up yet, but if you've missed something, it's worth checking. Um, so today is our federal leaders session. And after today, we only have our public speaking and debate session on March 4th. And so far, we're still planning on doing our field trip on March 10th to the state capitol. And the campaign and election will be, as we mentioned last time, at the Ridgefield Playhouse on March 27th. So we are really reaching the end zone here. It is Super Bowl weekend, right? Yeah. <laughs> so we thought we would kick off today's session with a kahoot. This is a kahoot about the federal government, just to see how much you know. Mrs. Mitchell, are we going to play all together or have, um, have everyone log in? Let's see if I can get it in the chat. I can put I can put it in the chat if you can. Okay. All right. So here we go to everyone. There we go. Let us know if you have trouble clicking through. Mentors should definitely participate too and check your knowledge. And Kavya is already in it. Awesome. I'm not going to play. <laughs> and I don't think Mrs. Gunther and Mrs. Mitchell and Mrs. Cordano are going to play. Here comes Gopika. Shucks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Question number one The branches of the US government are the executive blank and blank. Is it presidential, judicial and presidential, legislative and judicial, or financial and presidential? Sorry, um, I just went, uh, went to the Kahoot, but I just uh, was kicked out of the meeting. You were kicked out of the Kahoot? No, okay. I was kicked out of the meeting. Okay, whoever's playing tic-tac-toe, please turn off your yeah, thank you. Hannah, does that help? Can you access it now? Yep. Great. Okay, so question number one, the three branches of government are executive, legislative, and judicial. I'm seeing that some, some of you aren't able to get into the Kahoot, and I don't see other players either. Is that true? Is everybody having trouble? Aiz and Zania, yeah, they're they're having trouble. But everybody else can get in? Okay. All right, so um, if you can't get into the Kahoot, just listen along and see if you can answer the questions as we go through. I'll read them out loud. True or false? The president is in charge of each branch of government. It gives you plenty of time. False. The president is the head of the executive branch. Ooh, yes, I see lots more players now. Awesome. Question three. This branch of government makes laws and oversees presidential appointments. Is it the executive, legislative, the attorney general, or the Secretary of State. It's the legislative branch. That's the one we're gonna be hearing from today. 
Okay, question four. These people make up the, see if you recognize them, the court of honor, the department of justice, the attorneys general, or the Supreme Court. The answer is Supreme Court. Excellent. I can't, it's kind of small for me to be able to see, but Avni's doing amazing. Megan, I'm glad that the mentors are playing. <laughs> and Elise is definitely in an awesome position. Um, quiz. What makes up the legislature? Senators and representatives, the president and vice president, or secretaries of state? Excellent. The senators and representatives. I hope most of you got that. Did most of you get that? The only state that has not sent a woman to Congress is Virginia, Connecticut, Alabama, or Vermont. And the answer is Vermont has never sent a woman to Congress. Hmm. Let's see, true or false. There are two representatives from each state. Be sure you think about it if it's representatives or senators. So there are two senators from every state and representatives are based on the population in each state, which we'll hear more about today. Let's see. Ooh, the rankings aren't changing too much. All right. What percent of federal legislators are women? What do you think? Anyone who's good at math can do this one pretty fast here. But of all of the senators and representatives and even non-voting delegates. So the answer for 2022 is that 27%, just over a quarter are women. Number nine, you can become a Supreme Court justice just by the president picking you. True or false? It takes more than just the president picking you, right? Because your nomination has to be endorsed and approved by the legislature. Number 10, what doesn't the executive branch do? Does it not veto bills? Does it not make treaties? Does the executive does branch- Does not, not make treaties means no, tr does, does it make treats? <laughs> not quite. <laughs> treaties are agreements, usually like peace agreements. Uh, I go to the bathroom. <laughs> you guys are, you guys, as long as you're muted and you're appropriate, you can do what you need to do. Okay. Settle legal disputes is, is the one thing of that list that the executive branch does not do. Whoever, I don't know what I'm doing is, is, is actually doing a lot. It's doing great. Okay. The president's group of department leaders is called his posse, BFFs, cabinet, or his homies. And it's true, the cabinet, which is pictured here 
Think about it, those are the closest advisors and look how many there are. And it's not very private, is it? Look at this. I don't think every meeting is closed door. Look at all these cameras and speakers. That is a, a very intense meeting. That is a cabinet meeting. They have to leave their cell phones outside. They're not allowed to go in with a cell phone. And the last question, after the president and vice president, who is the next person in the line of succession? Meaning if something happened and the president and vice president were no longer able to serve, who would the, the next person in line be to be in charge of the country? So the options are vice president, speaker of the house, president pro tempore of the Senate, and Secretary of State? The answer is Speaker of the House. I saw some comments that that was tough. Were those hard questions? Some had new terms that we hadn't heard before, right? We don't hear about the President pro tempore of the Senate very often, for sure. <laughs> So these are, these are all very critical roles that we, we should know all about. And we should know who occupies those positions. In case something were to happen, we need to know who's gonna serve in those positions. Okay, number. So now that we're done with the Kahoot, do you recognize this building? Does anyone know what it is? You can go ahead and unmute. Is it the Capitol? I'm sorry, can you say that again? The Capitol. The Capitol. We talk a lot about capitals. So we have a capital in Hartford. We have capitals in states all across the country. Do you know which capital this is? I think the it's US the one capital. in Washington. Thank you, Charlotte. It is. It is the Capitol building in Washington. And do you know what happens there? Can someone else answer? Who knows what happens in that building? Do people make like important meetings there? <laughs> yes. Any idea what type of business there? The legislative no. branch. Exactly, it's the legislative branch. They are in the business of making laws for our country. That's their biggest job. Let's move on to the next slide. This slide, this, this image, it may be difficult to see. So if you would like to look at it um, separately, I'll put it in the chat. So you can also download it if you're interested, because I think this image is pretty neato. Um, this is the story about how a bill becomes a law. I thought the visualization was really cool. Um, and I wondered what you see. What do you notice about it? Anybody have an idea? Emily? It's kind of showing how like a law is made and like all the things it has to go through before it can be like a good and like standard law. Yes. And does it seem like a simple process? No. <laughs> I see some big eyes. No. Does it, I don't know if you can see these tiny hands, stop signs. These are potential ways that um, the process of a bill becoming a law can be interrupted or stopped completely. How many do you see? These are just examples. There could be more, but how many do you see? More than I can count. 12. Yeah, yeah, easily, right? There are, the idea with this was not for us to go into tons of detail, but for you to see how complicated it is and how there are so many ways on this path that the process can be interrupted. But can I go also, to the bathroom? yes, of course, but not just how it can be interrupted but also how many people are involved in the process and how many people have to agree before a law 
can be enacted. And there's one other question I had for you. On the left-hand side, do you see the four sort of origins of the, these ideas before they become a bill? So these are the, the ways that these ideas can materialize and where they come from. So it can the, the, the bills can come from representatives. They can come from the state level, from the state legislature. They can come from the executive branch, like the office of the president, or they can come directly from the people. So this is another way that you can raise your voice, right? Okay, the next slide is an example of legislation that was in front of Congress this week. So this, um, this information came from a website and anyone who wants to know what, what bills Congress is thinking about at a given time, they can go and look online. I'm wondering what are our Congress people thinking about this week and what are they gonna be discussing? Um, and where is the bill in the process of development? How many people have already co-signed and who are they? And maybe what motivates them to be part of this process? So this bill is called HR 3076, the Postal Service Reform Act. Did anybody notice anything about the mail over the last year or two? Did it seem totally normal to you? Did you experience anything funny about the mail? Go ahead and raise your voice. It might have been a little slower. It might have been a little slower, yeah. The post office has been experiencing significant delays, a lot of restructuring, a lot of reorganization, and they have been running lower and lower and lower on money for a variety of reasons. And the, I don't know, you may have noticed that the cost of mailing stuff has gone up and up and up. But a lot of people do things like voting by mail. And there are so many, so many business things that happen by mail that are absolutely critical to our democracy functioning. And so many representatives have been working very hard, sponsored by Carolyn Maloney. Have you heard of Carolyn Maloney before? She is a woman who is a representative for New York, for the 12th Congressional District of New York. So she was the original sponsor of this bill. And you can see the progress of how it went through that whole sort of the game of life of, <laughs> of how a bill becomes a law. And the, the incredible news is that this bill passed the House on Tuesday of this week in a vote of 342 in favor, 92 opposed. So now who knows what happens to it now that it moves out of, if it's past the house, do you know where it goes now? I see Bree's hand. Bree, you wanna unmute? You can't. Does anybody else know what happens once it passed the house? Now, where does it go? Muskan? To the public. To the public. Well, first it goes from the house to the Senate and then the Senate has to vote on it. Okay. We and can actually, yes. We all, I think Isa and Zaina also um, had a comment on that. Oh, go ahead. I thought that to make a law, um, people have to decide what the law should be and how they're going to like show people how to do it and and like like tell people like why they should do it so then it can become a real law that people follow. 
Well, part of the job of, of our elected officials is to receive input from their constituents, the people who have voted for them. And they definitely take that into account in the process as the bill is becoming a law, right? Because they get input from their constituents. Their constituents can see what, what's gonna be discussed in Congress and in the Senate each week. And they can feel pressure from their constituents, like people really support this or they really wish some things about it would be changed before it gets voted on. So in that way, you're absolutely right. Definitely the people have a, a, a voice in it. If we went back to the slide before, we could look quickly at the, at the process, maybe a little bit. Thank you. So it goes from, from just being born as a bill, as, as a piece of paper that they're, they're considering, right? And it's always moving. People say, oh yeah, I'll, give, I'll endorse it, but only if you add my ideas and the people in my district want it to have this and this too. So it goes through lots and lots of changes through debates and amendments. Then they have to think, how much money is it gonna cost? Do we have enough money for that to happen? The committees and subcommittees work on it. It gets it gets sent if it's passed from the House to the Senate. More debates, more amendments. Eventually, it might get approved, and then the president can always say, "Nope, I'm going to veto this." Even right at the end, right before it gets passed and becomes a law. Mm -mm. <laughs> so there are so many ways that it can be interrupted and um, definitely everybody wants to have their own opinion reflected in it before it gets to the end. So th this process is a full-time job for our elected officials and it'll be interesting to hear from our guest speaker today about exactly which ones she is supporting and why. So I'm going to hand the floor over to Gopika, and she can introduce our speaker. Gopika joins us from Hamden for each session. She has been Miss President U.S. of Hamden re-elected again and again, right, since 2019. She is now a seventh grader at the Foot School. She's a member of Model UN, and she plays basketball and she loves to read. We love having her in our program. So I'm gonna hand it over to you now, Gopika. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So today we are so excited and honored to have with us today, a US Congresswoman from right here in Connecticut and that's Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro. She has been elected 16 times and received the huge honor of being elected this year as a chair of the House Appropriations Committee. So welcome and can I ask you to a little a little bit to tell your the group a little bit about yourself and your role. Has she joined us yet? I don't hear you, Cordano. I do not think she has joined us yet. I was just she sending a text. She has okay. not joined us yet. Okay. So just so you all know, she is um, in between meetings with those four corners and the four cardinals. And she is so psyched to be able to jump out and, and meet us, but I have not seen her jump in yet. Okay, so how about this? How about we go on a quick tour of the Capitol? Um, and we imagine the place where she works and what it's like to visit there until we get her um, to join us. Mrs. Mitchell, could we jump to slide 14? Thank you. Welcome to the US Capitol. Until you can visit us in person, we're going to share with you some of our favorite aspects of a Capitol tour. Since 1800, Congress has met here in Washington, D.C. 
to represent the people and make laws. Both the U.S. House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate share the building. The House is on the south side or the left from this vantage point, and the Senate is on the north side or the right from this angle, with the rotunda in the middle under the Capitol dome. Notice the statue on top of the Capitol? We're going to see a model of her up close in the Capitol Visitor Center. Come on, let's go inside. When you visit the Capitol, you enter through the Capitol Visitor Center. People from the U.S. and around the world not only come here for tours, but also for conferences and meetings with members of Congress on important issues. This room was named Emancipation Hall to honor the enslaved people who worked to build the Capitol. Statues of people like Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth remind us of the many contributions that private citizens make to affect change in our country. Remember this statue from the top of the dome? This is the original plaster model that was used to create the bronze statue of freedom. It was designed by an American artist named Thomas Crawford, who had this model shipped to Washington DC all the way from Italy. The entire statue is 19 and a half feet tall. She is dressed in a classic Greco-Roman style to match the architecture of the building. She also wears a helmet topped with an eagle plumed crest and carries a sword, shield, and laurel wreath. After the model arrived, there was a problem. How to make this huge statue in bronze? It was Philip Reed, an enslaved man, who figured out how to take the model apart so that the foundry could cast it. By the time the statue was placed on the dome, Philip Reed was a free man. Okay, we're gonna pause because our guest speaker has arrived and I'm gonna ask Gopika to just very quickly um, reintroduce and hand over. Yes? And has she arrived? Oh, I, I thought I so. didn't let her in. I, oh, did. no. oh no. <laughs> she, is, she is jumping on. I'm just, I was gonna say, let's wait <laughs> until she's actually in the room before we okay. stop the video. Sorry about that. Ladies, when we have our, um, our Congresswoman join us. This this session is always tricky because their schedules are so jam-packed with the work of the federal government. And so it is really tricky to get everything to work without glitches and stuff. Um, should we go back to the video until she's until she's here? I think so. I mean, it'll be a minute or two. We might as well. Okay. free man. The first place we're going inside the historic Capitol building is the crypt. The crypt is not the fanciest room in the Capitol, but it has an important job. The arches and the 40 large columns not only hold up the ceiling, but also the 8.9 million pound dome you saw from the outside. The weight of the dome and the rotunda sits on the walls and the arches carry that weight to the columns so that everything is supported. There's a lot of engineering in there. And remember, in the 1800s, they had to do all of this without power tools or modern construction equipment. When Pierre L'Enfant designed the city of Washington, he put the Capitol building in the center of his design. This star in the crypt marks the place where the four quadrants of the city come together. We have a lot of statues in the Capitol. The crypt in particular has one statue from each of the original 13 colonies. This is a statue of Roger Sherman from Connecticut. Along with Oliver Ellsworth, Roger Sherman is the author of The Great Compromise, which is the part of the Constitution that laid out the ways in which Congress represents the people. Now let's go upstairs to see the rotunda, the room directly under the dome. Okay, Mrs. Mitchell, let's pause again. Thank you. 
Gopika, you can go ahead and um, and reintroduce as soon as she joins us. Thanks. Gopika, you can go ahead. Okay. We're so excited and honored to have with us today a U.S. Congresswoman from right here in Connecticut, and that's Representative Rosa DeLauro. She has been reelected 16 times, and she received the huge honor of being elected this year as a chair of the House Appropriations Committee. So welcome, and can I ask you to tell the group a little bit about yourself and your role? My gosh, am I excited to be with, uh, with all of you. Uh, I'm a, my name is Rosa DeLauro. I served as a U.S. representative for Connecticut's third congressional district. And Gopika, thank you so much. And uh, I understand you're an eighth grade student at foot. Uh, and I wanna thank you for your kind uh, and generous introduction. But I wanna offer you my congratulations on having been elected Ms. President Hamden, Hamden each year for the last three years. Uh, what an accomplishment. I wanna to talk to you about your campaign uh, and how you ran your campaign and the kinds of things that you did to persuade, you know, because campaigns are all about persuading voters, you know, that you're gonna do, you know, you, you really are gonna do right by them and you're gonna represent their, their interests. So, and if you've uh, been there for the last three years, you clearly are doing a good job. So, um, uh, and, I'm, and I'm honored to know you. Uh, let me also recognize Amanda Cardano for organizing the event, asking me to speak today. I'm grateful for you and all of the volunteers who are gathered out there today. Um, you know, it's about what you do and your efforts to motivate and to prepare our young women to aim for the highest civic leadership positions in our country. So again, it's great to be with all of you. I enjoy talking with students uh, because I believe that it's your energy your enthusiasm, our precious resources, and that your involvement in the political process is essential. So I'm especially proud to see so many young women engaging in civics in our communities and taking an interest uh, in our political uh, uh, system. You know, I come from a long line of strong women who are central to forming who I am today. Uh, my grandmother, uh, I kept a family pastry shop on Worcester Street in New Haven. And, you know, my, my grandfather died in, in, uh, in the Spanish influenza, uh, the pandemic, if you will, in 1918. And uh, he left my grandmother, uh, a, a widow and a single mom, if you will, with six children. And she took over running the family's pastry business after my grandfather passed away. My mom, uh, went to work at age 13 uh, in, the, uh, 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 in, the, in the pastry shop, but then she went to work in New Haven's sweatshops, the garment industry, making dresses uh, and shirt collars uh, before she became uh, the, uh, the longest serving member of the city of New Haven's uh, city council, their board of alders. Uh, and uh, she was the longest serving in history, not just the longest serving woman, but the longest serving member uh, in history. My dad also sat on the city council for a time in, in his career. So both my grandmother and my mom uh, created uh, opportunities, uh, helped to create opportunities for their families, for their community, for their city. And they remain my heroes uh, 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 today. Uh, and you know, from a very uh, young age, my mom encouraged other women to get involved in politics, to make their voices heard. Um, she became a public servant because she believed that government could help to make a difference in people's lives, that government could be a force for good in people's lives. Uh, so, and you know, she wasn't in the House of Representatives the way I am, but our kitchen table in our house, which is where she did her work, and I still have people who stop me on the street today uh, around New Haven who tell me, I will never forget your parents and all that they did to help me and my family. So, you know, and so it was my folks who inspired me 
uh, to get into politics. Uh, again, I told you they were both involved with politics, but it wasn't just elected office. They were engaged on behalf of their community and volunteering in their community. As a matter of fact, as a little girl, I can remember when uh, all the power, electric power went out in one of our senior citizen housing complexes. And so what my mom did was she went up and down the street on Worcester Street to all of the restaurants, and she had them all commit to donating food uh, for the senior citizens who lived uh, in Winslow Celentano. And she just did that on her own. She didn't have to do it, but she felt that that was something that was good to do uh, and that, that needed to get done. And she felt responsible. She felt responsible for those uh, senior uh, citizens. So it was about volunteering those, uh, volunteering your time with people, with families and students, just like you, like the work that, that, you, that you are doing. You know, I, I was engaged in a whole lot of, uh, as a volunteer, a, 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 a whole lot of political campaigns, uh, whether it was for mayors or for, uh, for presidential candidates like Gary Hart, Michael Dukakis, um, Bill Clinton, Barack Obama. Uh, but uh, I, uh, I, I managed Senator Dodd's uh, uh, Senate campaign and he won. And he invited me to come to work for him in, in Washington to be his chief of staff. And I took uh, the opportunity to do that, even though I had never worked in Washington. As a matter of fact, I'd only been to Washington for my high school class trip. So I knew nothing about what I was getting into. But you take a leap of faith. You can't be risk averse. And I say that to all of you young women. You can't be risk averse. I know sometimes you can be, look, I, I ran for Congress. I was scared. I had never run for a political office before. And I was scared. And it was a steep learning curve. But you got to take the chance. You got to look at the opportunities and weigh them and see if that's if it's a good thing for you. Then jump into the deep end of the pool, you know, and you'll find that you're able to you're going to swim and not sink. You're going to swim. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, and it was uh, at, 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 at some point when there was a seat that was open in this third congressional district, I decided to run for Congress uh, myself, and I as as uh, Gopika said, I, uh, since 1991, I have been serving in the House of Representatives. And you might say, well, what does, what does all of that mean? Well, look, every congressional district is roughly about 700,000 people. I represent the third congressional district, all of those people, all of you, if you live in the 25 towns that make up the third congressional uh, district. And what do, what do we do? You know, but one half of this is about making and writing the laws of the country. The other part of it is being out into the community, like talking with all of you today and then listening to you. And I hope you're ready with your questions. Today, I went to, I was at the airport, Tweed New Haven Airport, because we have a new airport service there that makes flights uh, to Florida at a good rate so that you can go to Disneyland and so forth, which is they've had 100 days of service and they're doing very well. Then I went to Guilford, where we have a company in Guilford, Connecticut, that is uh, producing a test uh, for COVID, uh, but not only for COVID, but you can take the test and it is a nasal swab uh, and they can tell you within minutes as to whether or not you are negative or positive or whether you might have the flu or so forth. Very, very exciting, very exciting stuff. And here I am this afternoon with the opportunity to talk to all of you and listen to what you are interested in. And you need to know what I do because everything that I do affects your lives. You know, we deal with education. I bet everybody here cares deeply about the environment. Wanna raise your hand if you care about the environment? Everybody cares about the environment. So, and we make the laws that govern that. We make the laws that deal with the amount of money that education that goes to your schools, uh, it, 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 et cetera. Um, and I, I just, um, I, I will say this to you and because I wanna get to the civics part of this and which is really incredible. In the House of Representatives, we disagree with one another. 
We don't always agree, but we don't disagree with our fists or with weapons. Now, somebody may ask me about the insurrection on January 6th. That's, that was not members of Congress fighting with one another. That was another force that, you know, that, that dealt with the attack on the Capitol. But we debate. Again, we don't do it with our fists. We don't do it with weapons. We do it with words. We go back and forth and we debate. And that's when you, and where civics comes in as well. And I'll talk about that because you listen to somebody else's opinion. They listen to you. You then can have the ability to change their minds or they may change your mind. And that's how we make progress by working with one another, by understanding our differences, by understanding different points of view and recognizing that we don't know it all and that we need to listen. And that is part of a, a public conversation, but is also a part of our lives, whether that you're dealing in politics, whether you're involved in your community, whether you're involved in your schools. Not everybody thinks the same way. And that back and forth is critical for you to achieve success. I will say something at this juncture, which I always say to young people. I want you to know that never be afraid to stand up for what you believe in, even though you might be the only person who believes that. You know, there was a woman who served in the House of Representatives from Montana. Her name is, her name is Jeanette Rankin. She voted against the First World War and a, she voted against the Second World War. Her, her age bridged this gap. And she said, I cannot vote to go to war. She was the only person but she stood up for what she believed in. And I say that to you, don't be afraid to stand up for what you believe in. And you defend it, not in a, confront not in a confrontational way, but you defend it on... Uh, what happened? Looks like we got cut off. Oh. That's not good. <laughs> so she'll, she'll come. She'll come, come back. The and video all night. I think she's really excited to hear your questions. So, is everyone who has a question formulated already ready to ask when she comes and, back? And, and Gopika we will call on them. I thought we were going to do the assigned ones first. We are. Yes. Yes. A Gopika will call on each of you. And how about if you don't have your camera on, when she comes back, please put your camera on because we will be taking a group photo. Don't we always do that? <laughs> yes, but I think. A, how do we take a group photo for like here? Here she is. Oh, we could. Okay. Ready, guys? Uh huh. Oh, we can't hear you. Okay, there sorry. We go. Again, I don't know what happened, so but we will just we'll we'll soldier on here. So um it's uh as I as I was saying, it is um you 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 need to Use what you believe and what you think about and uh, stand on your principles, but have the, the, the understanding that other people have serious views in the same way that you do. So, uh, so that, all, that you, you know that Congress, uh, uh, Congress controls all the, of the funding for the different branches of the federal government. Uh, this includes funding to help people who are hungry, who are sick, who are unemployed, who want to attend college but need assistance to pay for tuition, uh, and on and on and on. Uh, and that's where I have put my efforts as a member of the Congress. I serve as chair of the House Appropriations Committee, um, and 
the committee every year uh, spends $1.5 trillion uh, and that money goes to different federal uh, uh, agencies. So, and the task that is, is to uh, really uh, provide, as I said, the federal government has the ability to make a difference in people's lives for those who are working, for the middle-class families, for those who are vulnerable, uh, because government can make a difference if you are genuinely interested in serving your neighbors and you are willing to work for them and to fight for them. Uh, so that over, overall politics is an extremely rewarding career. Let me say something about uh, civics. Public service starts with civics. What is it? What is civics? You know, there's a, 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 a an academic you know, definition. Civics education is the study of the theoretical, political, and practical aspects of citizenship, as well as its rights and duties. But it's much more. Civics education is a lifelong journey. It's shared experiences that create and inspire engaged members of our communities, like you, like all of you who are involved in this effort. I believe that civics education is a bedrock. It's the fabric of our society and our democracy. And I think one of the things that's happened these days is you know, oftentimes civics programs are canceled in their schools and it's not taught very much in our schools anymore. That's why you have your organizations. I think that has been a problem, a serious problem in how we view and approach our democracy today and why people today have so are so confrontational with one another who don't listen to one another. Uh, and I think that that has had a very serious negative effect on our public conversation, our public discourse, as well uh, as our, our, our politics. And I think it hurts our democracy because civics fosters unity, conversations between people with different beliefs and backgrounds. That can help to bridge the divide that we see today in our political landscape. You know, I have introduced a piece of legislation and I should get that to all of you. It's called Civics Secures Democracy Act. It's a landmark and it's a bipartisan. That means both parties are for it. We have Democrats and Republicans who are supporting it. That it, what it does, it restores the importance that's placed on civics education in American classrooms with investments to support access to civics and to history education. I'm going to reintroduce it uh, uh, in the House of Representatives in the next few months to help bridge the divide in this country that continues to grow. As we neglect civics education, uh, 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 we will not be able to build a citizenry in form of our democratic principles, our norms, and our institutions. I'm gonna close with this. In 1933, a long time ago, you guys, long time ago, my mom wrote uh, 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 an article uh, in, a, uh, uh, in a democratic ward in a newsletter. And she, this is what she said, and I quote, uh, I have noticed, you see, it's, hello, can you hear me? I have noticed that the, uh, uh, the girls, unlike the men, are timid in asserting themselves in politics, and many a good idea is lost, having been suppressed by its creator. And she says, come on, girls, let's make ourselves heard. Now, my mom wrote that a very, very long time ago, but it is still so relevant today for young girls, for uh, uh, women, that we need to make our voices heard. And uh, 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 we need to do that. Your awareness of civics, your awareness of the political process and your involvement is very important. I urge you and I plead with you Stay engaged, stay involved, and be really inspired. I am inspired by the activism in your generation at such a young age. Keep it up. Again, make your voices heard. History 
has its eyes on you and you will be heard. You are our future leaders. You are future leaders of this country. And just looking at all of you, the future looks very, very bright. I'm so delighted you asked me to come and speak with all of you today. I'm gonna to stop there because I wanna take your questions. Thank you. Okay, so I think Emily had a question. Where are you, Emily? Oh, hi. Okay, hi. so my question is, um, what who grade are you in, Emily? I'm in what fifth grade. What grade are you in? Fifth Where? Grade. What school? What um, school? Ankwa. Okay. Um, my question is, who were your role models growing up? Well, I, I mentioned that, uh, you know, I think in my, my mom was a major force in, in, uh, in my life. And as I said, I, I came from a family of very strong uh, women, women who found themselves in situations where they had to take charge of their lives, you know, and, uh, uh, and, and you, you know, uh, uh, and I mentioned my grandmother who was widowed at a very, very young age with six children. Um, and she wound up being one of the finest, you know, best business, business women in the city of New Haven. Um, my, my mom uh, just took on politics with a vengeance when women were not really participating in politics in the way that they are today. So things have changed, changed for the good. I will go a step further with you, just further on. There is a woman who was the first, uh, she's a, she continues to be my role model today. Uh, a woman who was the first secretary of labor uh, in the history of the United States. Her name is Frances Perkins. She uh, was the first labor secretary for Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And she was responsible. He tasked her with putting together the social security system that you are too young to take advantage of today, but maybe your folks and your grandparents rely on social security. So role models for me, including my family, are uh, women who have made a difference in people's lives. That has been their mission. And I know you have those role models in your life as well, Emily. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, that was a great answer. Um, next, Evelyn has a question. Where are you, Evelyn? I'm right here. Um, my yeah. question was, um, what issues do you care most about? Yeah, okay. Where do you go to school, at, uh, Evelyn? Um, Slater Mill. I didn't hear it. Slater Mill School. Okay. And what grade, my dear? Um, fifth grade. Fifth grade. Okay. All middle schoolers. I love it. I love it. Uh, I, the issues that I've taken, uh, a lot of the issues that I have taken up have to do with, uh, uh, it's women. I, I introduced the first, uh, the, the, the legislation that uh, would pay uh, women in the same jobs as men the same pay that the men get. And you might think, well, my God, why isn't that the case now? That's not true in the United States. Uh, women are paid about oh, only about 78 cents on the dollar. They're paid, and men and women, in the, my, so the legislation says men and women in the same jobs should be paid the same amount of money. I've taken a big interest in what happens uh, to children uh, in their education, uh, in their health, and uh, the ability to lift children in our country uh, out of poverty. Uh, I, I, I've worked a lot on issues of, of food and nutrition. I've done a lot of work with the school lunch programs, the school breakfast programs, uh, the food stamp program, uh, and nutrition, and, and child nutrition. Um, uh, and then some other areas I care uh, deeply about uh, 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 making sure that um, uh, working people uh, can uh, get a decent wage, have good working conditions, uh, and so that they're able to take care of their families. Uh, so, and uh, I also have done a lot of work on trade issues and how we trade with other countries uh, to the extent that that means 
how we don't shortchange American workers in that in that uh, in that process. So I think it's fair to say that I spent a lot of time on the issues of children and families uh, and, uh, uh, and 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 women uh, in in the Congress, as well as some other um, uh, uh, budgetary issues and trade issues as well. Okay. I, uh, I, I'm just looking at hands raised here, so I don't know what the order you raised your hands in. So it looks like I have, is it Mila? Okay, go ahead. And then I see Eustinma uh, and Charlotte. Okay, go ahead, Mila. Um, sometimes do you have to like leave your family or like oh. go to work on short notices? Mm -hmm. You've asked a very good question, kiddo. Um, yes, is the answer to that. You do. Um, I, I, you know, one of off, oftentimes, you, you know, you don't go home every night for dinner with your family. Uh, you don't see your extended family. My, I have lots of cousins and so forth. I don't get to see them that often. Uh, I, sometimes I don't even know. Uh, like during the week. I work in Washington during the week. I come home uh, to New Haven on the weekends. And sometimes I don't know if we're going to come home on Thursday, on Friday, or maybe we're going to be in session during the weekend. I've had to cancel uh, vacations uh, because I, you, you know, we've, th that happens, but it goes with the job. It's, there's so many rewards in the job that you understand that. And, you know, I'm so lucky. I have a very understanding family and they understand when I can't be there. But one of the hardest things, and I'll tell you one of the hardest things during this pandemic was not being able to see my grandkids as often as I like. I have six grandchildren uh, and uh, I do everything I can with my schedule, not to get in the way of the time that I have put aside to spend with my grandchildren. But yes, the job gets in the way of, you know, doing as much as you would like with your family, but there's good trade-offs because you can get some good things done, okay? Okay, now did I pronounce your name right? Yustimna? Yes, that's correct. Yustina. Okay. Yustina, okay, go for it. Um, did, did like COVID affect your job? Did it make it harder Ooh. or better? Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna go back at you. Did COVID affect you? Lordy, we know how it's affected all of you guys. Yes, because all of my staff were working remotely. I didn't go into my office either in Connecticut or in Washington for almost a year and more. I worked from both my house in New Haven and my house in Washington. And that was, it's, it's different when you're, you have people all around and you're, talking back and forth and you're getting things done that way but when you are you know by yourself and you know you have to take on doing things that you know you could easily call someone who's in the next office and say hey look can you get this for me or can we do this and <coughs> it took more time and effort and it was also great stress you know to think about uh, how at risk um, uh, everyone was. At the beginning of the pandemic, it was, uh, I think, frightening for everyone. This was so new, had, had, this had not happened to us in a generation. And uh, that we saw people that we know, that we love, were getting ill, some of whom may even have passed on. And so it was very hard and a big strain. Let me just ask you, how big of a strain was it on you and your friends? Well, it was really hard. So like the first year of COVID, um, uh, we, um, even we didn't have Zoom. We, we just, um, the only period we would have for Zoom was for spelling. And that was like once a week. So our teacher would just send remotely um, a video of her yeah. and her husband. And it was just horrible. Yeah, it's terrible. It has been terrible. And I've seen it in my own grandchildren. And, you know, different, I mean, children are all different. And I know, you know, one of my granddaughters was fine. She could deal with this stuff. I have a grandson who just, he, he had such a struggle 
such a struggle with all of this. And I worry about, I worry about all of you. I worry about our kids and what that strain and stress has meant in your life. In addition to which, you know, school is even work is socializing with others of, of that conversation back and forth, of laughing, of, you, you, you know, of being serious or, you, you know, just the normal everyday thing and all of the events at the school that you couldn't go to, all of the events, you know, that I had to cancel, you know, that I, 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 I couldn't go to, you know, so it has been a very, very difficult experience, you know, for everyone. And my hope is that we are on the other side of this, but I'm also of the view that we have to follow the science and do what we need to do uh, and uh, uh, get tested, get vaccinated and uh, uh, get the booster shot. And now I'm so delighted that, you know, younger kids are able to get the, uh, uh, the, the vaccinations uh, as well. Now, Charlotte had a question. Thank you. Yes, um, you were saying before how you were doing work with like food and children and women and everything right. and poverty. And I'm in fifth grade and I go to Scotland Elementary School and our fifth grade classes, all three of them are doing a lot of work with student council and everything. And just in general, with water for south sudan and i thought that that would be something that you could participate in yeah that is an ex an excellent pro project uh you, you know there are so many places where you know we take do you i do take water for granted right yeah yeah i've got my bottle here you turn on the tap you know and some places that just doesn't exist so i think that is about really caring and, and doing a project of that nature. And, you know, at the federal government letter uh, level through the state to our state department and, uh, and USAID, USAID, we work with countries in terms of, of, of uh, places where there is serious water sh shortage and how we were able to bring water, uh, potable, potable water, uh, so that it's not river water where people are getting ill and you know and, and sick yeah. from, from the water so what a they're great drilling, project. they're drilling wells in south sudan yes yeah now how are you involved with that tell me a, a little bit about the project um well we have it's it's really student council in our um yeah. in our school we have project we have um programs and um every wednesday we learn more about water and stuff and mm -hmm. and we like re really learn how um how much everything is like taking mm -hmm. a bath is like 70 gallons of water mm -hmm. taking a shower mm -hmm. is 15 to 25 flushing mm -hmm. a toilet once is a gallon mm -hmm. is a gallon yeah yeah and a half Right, and, and you never really realize that. You never, you never, you never you don't, we don't think about it. And do you recall what happened in, in Detroit, Michigan, just a few years ago, in Flint, Michigan? No. They rerouted water in Flint, Michigan. So it was going through the lead pipes and 9,000 children got lead poisoning, lead contamination. And so, you know, one of the things that we're going to do at the federal level, no, it's in what? the in, in the infrastructure bill that we just passed. It was a bipartisan piece of legislation. We're going to replace all of the lead pipes in the country, so we can help to prevent lead poisoning, because you know there is no amount of lead in water that is safe, it is all harmful and it affects pe young people, children's ability to learn and that's forever. So clean water is so critical. 
whether you're looking at the United States or whether you're looking at the South Sudan and bringing water to people. That is life. Yeah. Water is life. Yeah. Good for you. I saw somebody else's hand up. Uh, do um, I see it? Pip had a question, so Pip, Who's that? go ahead. Who's speaking? Oh, I'm speaking, Go Fika. I think Pip had a question. So if you want to go ahead, Pip. Um, so hi, my name is Pip and- um, I can't hear you so well, speak up, sweet. Sorry, um, my name is Pip and my question is, why did you run for office to begin with? Okay. Um, thank you, that is a very, very, very good question. Um, you know, I, I told you, I, I come from a family who was in deeply engaged in public service and in public policy. I didn't start out thinking about, um, you know, that what I was gonna do was to run for office. As a matter of fact, when I probably was your age, I think my father asked me, what do you wanna be when you grow up? As all parents ask the kids. I said, I wanted to be a tap dancer. I did, there was honest and truth. I wanted to be a tap dancer. So my father said to me, well, he said, you need to get a better profession, something that's more stable. So what do I do? I run for office every two years. And you know, it's yes, it's, it's got stability, but that, that was an aside. I had a good role models, good examples from both of my parents uh, who were deeply involved, uh, not just in elected politics, but in the lifeblood of their community and their city. So, and their role, if I can describe it best, they were advocates uh, for people. People came to them and said, my son or daughter needs a job or is out of job, can you help? Or someone else would come, we have an immigration problem, can you help? I need, can you help us to do this or that? My business needs, you know, some help. Where do I get that help? My parents both volunteered at school crossing guards when they weren't a school crossing guard or somebody was sick. So they were deeply engaged in elected politics and in the life of their community. So I grew up with that. And when I think about the role of a member of Congress, it is the role of an advocate. I advocate on behalf of the people that I represent. I advocate on your behalf. And where better to be able to do that than for me was in the United States House of Representatives. So when the opportunity arose to run for the Congress, I took it. Even though, as I said, I had never run for a public office before, I took it on. And you know, people have said to me, Congresswoman DeLauro, has this job met your expectations? And I have said, even on the most difficult days, this job exceeds my expectations. So it was kind of a natural thing for me to wind up where I did, though I didn't start out thinking that, that that's what I was going to do. Thank you. Um, we have our last question from Elise. Elise, where are you? Uh, hi, I'm Elise, um, fifth grade. Um, I, I can't hear you, Elise. You're breaking up. Um, I said, where do you get the courage to fight for these issues? Well, you know, we all come to the job with, you know, you, you come for a reason, you come with a certain set of values, you just don't make them up. I, I have said that because the press asks me all the time, Congresswoman DeLauro, you know, what makes you take on specific issues? What makes you vote the way that you do? 
uh, and, and, and champion the issues that we do. And it's not the 32 years that I've spent in the House of Representatives, but it is growing up in an Italian Catholic family, which is where I learned my values. I come from a blue collar family, uh, a, a, a family that struggled financially. Uh, and so when the issues come up about uh, workers and kids and uh, people who need uh, uh, food stamps or child nutrition or these efforts, it is because I believe that that is what the federal government ought to do. And it springs from what, what my own uh, 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 experience is and my own values and my own family experience with which I grew up with, which what I grew up with. Uh, and those are the issues that, um, you, you, you know, they're challenging. And those are the issues that I would like to take on. And this job gives me the opportunity to do it. And so many others. I mean, we talk about, you know, gun violence, you know, research, um, you know, you, you talk about uh, 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 training for people for, you know, for jobs, uh, which we need to do today. Uh, uh, you talk about, I've talked about, you know, climate and the environment, and, you, you know, so important today with climate change and what we're doing to preserve, you know, preserve our environment. Uh, 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 you know, there's, there's so, so many important uh, uh, issues to take on. And you know what I tell you, you know, people give you energy. I love, uh, and Gopika, I don't know if you enjoy the campaigning, but I enjoy the campaigning because you get to meet people, people give you energy uh, and you listen to them and you understand what their difficulties are and you wanna to try to help in any way you can. And at the federal level, you can, you, can, you, you can help to do some things. The same way you can help make changes in your school. You can listen to your, your, your peers and help to make changes. You can do that in your cities, in your towns, in the state. It's, it's the same. It is the, um, you know, relishing that role of advocacy on behalf of other people. And for some people who people who don't have a voice and you have to be a champion for those who do not have a voice. Thank you so much. And do you have any closing words of advice for us? Well, I do. And I'm going to quote my mom again. Um, she taught me early on and it has served me very, very well. First of all, I, I, I just wanna say, I love the questions. I love the interaction. I love what you are attempting to do is I understand there are three chapters. We're now thinking about a chapter uh, in Hamden. Uh, and that is, uh, that's, that, that, that's, that's ter terrific. Uh, uh, because I, I think you, you have all um, really put your finger on something that is sorely missing in the United States today. And that is civil, civic discourse, conversation. People know their government, know the institutions uh, and, and can engage in a very positive way and not in a negative, not in a negative way. But my mom told me uh, 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 really, don't take no for an answer and don't give up, don't give up. You can't, you know, sometimes things are hard to do. Um, and I, I'll give you a piece of legislation. I fought for something called the child tax credit for 18 years, 18 years. We have a child tax credit now. I'm fighting to make sure we can do it on a, a more permanent basis, but you can't give up and you can't get tired. You keep at it and you will find that you can make the change that you uh, have intended to do. So. Don't take no for an answer and never give up. So you're fabulous, you're wonderful. And I, I you know, I hope, I, I wish I could meet you all in person. I really do. Maybe we can do that sometime. And Gopika, did you like campaigning for the job? I loved it. All right, isn't it wonderful? And it's, did you find that you had to listen to a lot of folks? I did, I had to, I had to, like think about it was important to me and if other people would be affected by it too and so you can relate with who you're speaking to that's right yeah that's true and sometimes people 
you know, not everybody is supportive of you. You know, you have to deal with those people who don't support you as well. And you have to listen to them. You all take care and have a great weekend. Thank you, Congresswoman Deloro. We would love to have a photo with you. Oh God, that's <laughs> If terrific. you don't mind, we, no. can, we can all uh, turn on our video and maybe wave <laughs> and say that's thank you so much to the Congresswoman for joining us today. And, and clap thank your hands, you. give, a, give a big clap. Thank you and so much. Thank Congresswoman you. Deloro. Thank you. Our election is on March 27th. If you have the afternoon free, we would we'll send you the link. You could join oh, us virtually okay. if you're interested. Okay. I, I love elections. I really do. <laughs> <laughs> so Thank let you. me know. And you're fabulous. You guys are really fabulous. Take care of yourselves. Be safe. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. So, ladies, wow, that was exciting, huh? Um, I think we would we need to hand over to Avery for a stretch break at this point. Everybody knows Avery at this point. About seven minutes. See if you can come up with some ideas in those breakout rooms. Maybe try to remember all the issues that Rosa was talking about. School lunches, poverty, child tax credit. Girls, are you able to jump into those breakout rooms? Welcome back girls and mentors. Thank you. Um, I want to hear, actually, instead of hearing, if you could put in chat some of the ideas you were talking about in your breakout rooms. Can you add to the chat any issues that you are really inspired by now? Something that motivates you? Because I'm looking at the slide that we have, that was um, the word cloud of the issues that motivated you that you were interested in at the last session. These are the words that you came up with, the issues that were interesting to you before. And I wonder if having listened to some other participants and to our Congresswoman, if any of your ideas are different now than they were even at the last session. These are so great school lunch variety, animal abuse, um, women's rights, men's rights, littering, animal cruelty. Some of them are similar, right? But I'm seeing some even more nuanced issues than before. Gun control, affordable electric vehicles, amazing. Um, school lunches, I don't remember seeing school lunches before, but that was discussed today. So I'm, I'm interested that you heard that and that you're thinking about it too. Opportunities to experience the arts, fantastic. Thank you. I hope factory farms. Brie, that's a, that's a familiar issue, I think. I think this is consistently inspiring to you, wonderful. Okay, I don't wanna go over time today, but I'm really glad to see um, that you're inspired by these issues. And I wanna, so the video tour of the Capitol that we started, we'll send it to you if you wanna watch the rest of it. I was so excited to see it just because we can't go there physically or we haven't been able to for such a long time that it was really neat to be able to experience it on video. So we're going to send it to you so you can watch it in your own time. And I want to close today with an inspirational quote. Raise your hand if you've been watching the Olympics. Yes, thank you. And raise your hand if you knew that the first gold medal that was won in the Olympics this year was won by a woman from Connecticut. <laughs> yes. So this woman, Lindsay Jacobellis, forgive me if I'm not pronouncing her name properly. She's a snowboarder and she won the first gold medal um, in this Winter Olympics by the United States. 
she was quoted in the Connecticut Hour two days ago by saying, it doesn't define you. She asked this when someone, um, when they asked her what message she'd send to younger racers about mistakes of the past, because she is 36 years old. And most people would say that she's too old to compete in the Olympics. She's too old to be Olympian. But she said, no, especially if you've made it to this stage, you're a winner. And look at what you've learned from the experience and take that with you later in life. I hope the experience of running for Miss President and meeting with our Congresswoman is an experience that you will take with you later in your lives. And you'll think back on what Rosa DeLauro shared with you today. And if you, like me, want to watch it again, um, we're gonna post it on our website so you can rewatch some of those answers that she gave to your questions because she really responded directly to you and wanted to know about you and meet you. Um, and I, I'm just so pleased that you participated so beautifully with her and listened so well. And I hope that you can really take her advice to heart about not taking no for an answer and never giving up. And we will see you at our next session, which is the eighth session, Friday, March 4th. Until then, let us know what your intentions are for your campaigns. And if you have any questions or want to be matched up with other participants and mentors for your campaigns. Thank you. And happy, val happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. Oh yeah, it's on Monday. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> you should have really added a heart. You should have added a heart for fun. There we go. Bye. Have a good Valentine's Day. You too. Have a good Bye. Valentine's Day. Bye. Bye, Charlotte. Have fun with your baby. I will. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Just for Valentine's Day, I got my braces in Valentine's Day colors. <laughs> Which is red and pink. <laughs> nice. Bye. Bye. Bye, Hannah. Bye, Hannah. Bye. Bye. Bye, Avery. Thanks oh, for stretching us out. Mentors. Of course. Yeah, that was nice. <sighs> <laughs> Have a good Thanks, weekend. Thanks, Emily Calvia. Bye. Bye. Bye, Avi. Good weekend. Happy Valentine's. <laughs>